Before Achilles went off to fight Hector, he hid away on the island of Skyros disguised as a woman. Okay, so there's a bit of context here, but it is really true. This is a story which took place between the abduction of Helen and the storming of Troy. When Menelaus convinced his brother Agamemnon to raise an army, Achilles, the great, angry, argumentative warrior, took a rather eventful holiday on Skyros before going off to prove his worth and gain his eternal fame at Troy. Why? Well, you're about to find out. In this story, the scene opens on Thetis, Achilles' goddess, sea nymph mother. Paris and Helen were on their way back to Troy, and as they crossed the Aegean Sea, Thetis, with shock, had a vision. It was a vision of a thousand Greek ships, a war-storming armada following in their wake. She fled to the surface of the sea with her fellow nymphs, and when on shore, exclaimed, Already I see a thousand hulls surge across the Ionian and Aegean seas. The Greeks will soon search for my Achilles over land and sea, and he will want to follow them. Video yam mille carinis ionium aegeumque premi, yam pelago terisque meus quae retur Achilles, et volet ipse sequi. With haste, she urged Poseidon to sink Paris's ship and stop the years of war that she knew would soon follow. But, as you'll find out from my previous video on the true origins of the Trojan War, link in the top right, Poseidon knew Zeus would never allow that. As Statius records it, Consulta belli Jupiter et tristes edixit caedibus annos. Jupiter had announced his decree of war and sorrowful years of bloodshed. So Thetis travelled to find her son, still living with Patroclus under the watch of Chiron the Centaur. But when she arrived at the Centaur's cave, he confessed to her that Achilles had far outgrown his control now, and was known to cause havoc in the nearby lands, even towards other centaurs. His famous anger was already brewing. When Achilles returned from a hunt with Patroclus, he was nevertheless happy to see his mother, and the four of them spent that night rejoicing, while Achilles played his lyre and sang of tales of Hercules and his father Peleas. It was clear that the boy, as he became a man, dearly wanted to match their mighty deeds. This only made Thesis all the more worried, and when Achilles went to sleep, she wondered how she could prevent him from going to Troy. Because there was a famous prophecy that not only would Achilles die if he went there, but also that the Greeks would never win without him. That is why she knew she needed to hide him, so that they would never find him. So, she decided to send him to the kingdom of Lycomedes on Skyros, which was home to many peaceful women, and, to her mind, the safest place for him. She knew he wouldn't go willingly, so that night she summoned and prepared her Delphinas Biugos, her watery carriage drawn by two dolphins. Chiron helped her carry the sleeping Achilles into it, and she travelled with him across the ocean to Skyros. She then dressed him in women's clothing, and when he awoke, he was, as you might imagine, incredibly angry. She was depriving him of his kleos, his glory. She did try to persuade him. Zeus took female forms all the time. Dionysus wore such robes that she wouldn't tell Chiron or anyone else. But he was all but ready to throw off the clothes and leave when he saw the daughters of Lycomedes on the shore and, in typically mythological style, fell head over heels for the princess Deidamia. Thetis noticed his sudden blush and youthful glow and pounced on this newfound opportunity. Go join them in disguise, son, and who knows what'll happen in the future. Maybe I'll get to cradle a new Achilles in my arms. He relaxes and lets her finish the outfit adorned with her own necklace, and she teaches him how to walk and talk like a woman. She takes him to Lycomedes, and as convincing as a god can be, persuades him that Achilles is, in fact, the sister of Achilles. What's funny is, while Lycomedes believes her and lets Achilles into his daughter's home, the daughters themselves can't help but notice how he stands head and shoulders above them all, with the shoulders and chest of a wrestler. So, anyway, Achilles came to live amongst the women of Skyros as one of them. But war was indeed brewing, and the lands of Greece amassed to sail to Troy. 
The leaders leapt to action, but they thought, where on earth was mighty Achilles? They searched high and they searched low, but he was not with his mother, nor was he with Chiron. The prophet Calchas, however, insisted that Achilles was vital and demanded on the authority of his great-grandfather Apollo where the hero was. So Diomedes says to Odysseus that the task to find him must fall on them. They will go and bring Achilles to Agamemnon. Meanwhile, the daughters of Lycomedes had unsurprisingly realised Achilles was indeed a man. How ridiculous if they hadn't. Now here's a bit of controversy, but not unexpected from the angry hero, or the time period, or mythology in general. He'd set his sights on Deidamia, and although she spurned his advances, he persisted. Had it not been a Greek myth, she'd probably have continued persisting too, but Achilles had manly strength and manly love. From dawn to night, he would sit beside Deidamia, where he would kiss her hand. Achilleus thumon da eneros eche, kai eneros echen erota. Ex aeus de epinucta parit teto Deidameiai, kai potementenas e file hera. She gave in, and they began sleeping together. It was with Deidemia that Neoptolemus, who would eventually kill King Priam, was born. Ancient writers are quick to label this sort of behaviour as appropriate, and Ovid even includes the story in his Art of Love, his Ars Amatoria. Achilles cried out rather childishly in this poem, Why, with your sweet voice, do you fight against the man who ravishes you? Why, Deidemia? Sure, there's shame in being the one to first begin the deed, but when another does it for you, it's nice. Quid blanda voce morares auctorum stupri deidamia tui? Scilicet ut pudorest quaedam coe pisse priorem, sic alio gratum est ecbiente pati. So just remember, please don't listen to Ovid when it comes to love. While all this was happening, Apollo, who was well known to hate Troy, had shown Odysseus and Diomedes where Achilles was hidden. So Odysseus set sail with him to Skyros, equipped with the paraphernalia required for the rites of Bacchus, an important point which we'll come to later. They arrived at Lycomedes' palace, and the king welcomes them as Greek kings themselves. He announces a feast, and that evening his daughters arrive. Odysseus tries to see which Achilles is, but in the dark, as they are all reclining, he cannot tell. He had, however, noticed one just before they sat down, who stood out, something he noted to Diomedes next to him. Odysseus then made a speech to the court around him about battles and the chance for glory at Troy, hoping Achilles could not resist the call to war. But Deidami restrained him. Odysseus then changed tack and offered his Bacchic gifts, fake shields, spears, turbans and robes, to be performed in a ritual dance suggesting they'd be used tomorrow by the daughters of Lycomedes. The next morning was the day of the dance, and it was there that Achilles was manifested to Odysseus and Diomedes. Lost in the worlds and the music, it was clear that he was no woman. So, when it was over, Odysseus approached the disguised hero and, speaking directly, exclaimed, Up now! Hide here no more! Let the treacherous Trojans grow pale, let your father hear this, and crafty Thetis be ashamed to have feared so for you. Heia abrumpe moras, sine perfida paleat ide, et juvet haec audire patrem, pudeatque dolosum sic prote timuissi tetin. Unable to resist any longer, Achilles stripped himself of the disguise as Diomedes blew a mighty blast on his horn and he appeared to rise even larger than before, the very embodiment of war. Surrounded by screams and noise and chaos, he dropped his toy weapons and seized up a true spear and shield. As the court calms down, he apologises, to his credit, the very least that he could do, to Lycomedes and confesses that he'd also borne a son with Deidamia. Lycomedes eventually relented at the thought of a mighty grandson, and not only pardoned Achilles, but offered two full ships of Scyrians to join the Trojan War. Diomedes and Odysseus left in success with Achilles, who joined them at the assembly of Greek kings at the head of the Myrmidon troops. And with that, the Greeks were ready for their assault. For the source material, I've used Statius's Achilleid, Ovid's Ars Amatoria, Aelius Aristides, uh, his orations, and the earliest source of all, an anonymous authors, but possibly by Bion of Smyrna, 
Epithalamium, i.e. the nuptials, of Achilles and Deidamia. Stay tuned for more stories from Troy. <laughs>